Hi, everybody. It is October 31, 2017. I want to show you something. Can you imagine just hanging out and you're talking to people and all of a sudden there is this beam of light and boom! Wow! And then a, a mild earthquake occurs out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. You don't see any bomb falling. You just see this beam of light. Here we go. Wow. Wow. Now that is quite the explosion, don't you think? And did that occur from a laser? Well, I don't know. But it sure did shake up that environment. All right. Um, listen to this. Seven secret super weapons that actually exist. But I'm just going to show you one. The invisible tank? In 2013, BAE Systems developed a tank which could sneak up on unsuspecting enemies. The adapt for technology uses infrared and electronic frequencies to not only blend the tank into the background, but it can even make it appear as if it is something else entirely, such as a regular road car, a cow, or heck, even a little girl with a lemonade stand. It can be any of those things by using thousands of 14 centimeter pixel panels which mimic the temperature of the tank's surroundings. BAE indicated they were experimenting with further uses, and by further uses we mean developing actual invisibility. BAE, incidentally the greatest acronym for an evil weapons manufacturer ever, have announced that their researchers are currently adapting this technology to work with other wavelengths of light. And if they succeed, we might finally have the most powerful weapon the planet has ever seen. Because it doesn't matter how big your guns are, you can't hit what you can't see. That's right. So, guess what? Tanks can have lasers on them. And, well, we all know that they're um, are cloaking devices, and they can make essentially anything disappear, invisible. So, this video was sent to me by Ziggy uh, Keller. Thank you, Ziggy. Santa Rosa fires the infamous blue laser caught unknowingly. And he is sharing a video of Flash News, Napa Fire, Santa Rosa, California, Wildfire, Sonoma, Yuba, Tubbs, at, at, Atlas, County, Fires, Burn, Canyon. We have heard, and I have heard from subscribers of mine who live in that area, who said that they saw blue sparks, blue lights. Look at this. <laughs> Yeah, there was hella fucking cars over there, dude. Wow. That was pretty clear, huh? All right, I will link below to everything that I'm going to show you, but yeah, here, here it is. Where does that come from? And it certainly does look like a laser, doesn't it? All right. Um, I've received comments from subscribers and messages asking me if I heard this interview with Dane Wigington on Cabin Talks channel. This is Claudia interviewing Dane about geoengineering, but they also talk about these California fires. And Claudia asks Dane, could they have been made from lasers? Could the fires have been started by lasers? Could they have decimated whole areas? And according to Dane, he states this is the narrative so many have blindly jumped on board if we leap 
without looking and investigating. It's not helpful to the credibility of our cause. So, like Judy Wood, we can't question the use of directed energy weapons. And I think you would all agree that all of the weapons that we actually know our military has, as well as militaries around the world, China and Russia in particular, but other countries, don't you agree that they have weapons that we don't know about, that we could hardly even imagine? So, we are, I guess, blindly jumping on board this uh, narrative when we have questioned the use of directed energy weapons. Without looking, we haven't looked. We're just jumping on board blindly. We haven't looked at any of the videos. We haven't listened to anybody who said the winds came up from nowhere. That lightning did not bring about these fires despite what NASA tells us. Don't you love my computer? Don't you love it? I love it. I love it. I get to relax, you know, when I try to change pages. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, NASA website, for finally coming in. So this is wildfires running amok in California. And NASA says that there was lightning. There was no lightning. Even Dane Wigington says lightning didn't bring these fires about. Firefighters have said that they have never seen fires like this, and there was no lightning. But NASA claims there was lightning. It was the deadly combination of lightning winds and hot weather, which dries the landscape into tinder. And, well, if that landscape was tinder, you would think that those trees might have been... Uh, caught up in the fire, but they seem to look like they're untouched. The trees, you know, Dane, in the f first half of this, he's talking about the geoengineering, and he's talking also about the trees uh, that are being killed off from the geoengineering from the bottom up due to all of the chemicals and the heavy metals. Uh, the UV rays that are so intense now because our ozone layer is collapsing due to the geoengineering, but also our military flying its supersonic jets in the ozone layer. So the trees are dying from that as well. Um, and he talks of how the trees are just rather incendiary. They are an incendiary mess because the leaves and the trees have collected all of the incendiary metallics, the heavy metals, aluminum in particular. But then when asked about all of the evidence that homes were destroyed, stores, McDonald's, and Arby's destroyed in a parking lot, but the bushes and the trees around them are literally untouched, still have their leaves on them. Suddenly the trees are green. That's what Dane Wigington said. The trees are green. And they're redwood trees. So redwood that he has um, surrounded his home by redwood trees are very difficult to burn. All of those trees were redwood trees, I guess, which is not true. But he also says that uh, depending on the direction of the wind will, will really depend on where the fire is going. So the parking lot 
And I have it in my other videos, the parking lots that you see with all of those trees surrounding the mall, surrounding the McDonald's and Arby's and another structure that burned to the ground, but none of the trees. Somehow that the winds just navigated the fires like in between the trees, in between the bushes to get to that structure. I really don't understand this, and I'm not even going to speculate on what the hell is going on. But to say that we are discrediting the movement because there is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the verifiable evidence that exists, because we have conclusive evidence that climate engineering set the stage for these fires, might have even fueled the winds. I, I guess what he's saying is, why bring up something that you can't find evidence for? And he as he has said previously, that by bringing up what he claims there's no evidence for, we will, we will push back those climate scientists and they won't want to join the movement. We have to have a credible movement so, questioning whether or not directed energy weapons were used somehow discredits the anti-geoengineering movement. And climate scientists, I guess they're just waiting until we have mountains and mountains and mountains of, of credible evidence before they finally come out of the closet and join the movement and we'll be talking honestly about what's going on with the weather modification and with the geoengineering? Really? Well, isn't it too bad that these climate scientists are so easily influenced by what YouTubers are saying? Wow! That they don't have a mind for themselves and they can't just come out and start speaking about what's happening. No! We're pushing them back because we question something that is not related to the geoengineering. Even, he says, which is really phenomenal because in virtually every video that I have listened to where people are questioning the use of directed energy weapons and the possibility of lasers starting these fires, they also talk about the geoengineering. They also talk about how we have been, and certainly that area in particular, has been so saturated with these chemicals and heavy metals that make the trees and uh, no doubt the homes um, far more incendiary than they would have been. Everybody mentions that. But he states, we conclusively can say that climate engineering set the stage, might have even fueled the winds, and he hopes that people will, I guess, stop talking about directed energy weapons, and he encourages people to consider these factors. The spraying of chemicals and heavy metals, making the trees more incendiary, the UV rays, which are much stronger, more intense now due to our collapsing ozone, the electrical uh, conductivity of the atmosphere from all of the metallic particles. Who's not considering all of that? It's, um, it's maddening. It's almost as if you can't hold in your mind different aspects of an event. 
different things that occur in one event. And yes, I do believe that we can conclusively say that climate engineering certainly set the stage for how violent these fires were. But that does not mean to say that we can't also recognize all of the other, or, or not other, but the anomalies and consider what people are saying who live there, that the winds came out of nowhere, that they saw blue light, that they saw these blue sparks. And no, I'm sorry. Um, it, it makes absolutely no sense that these structures were burnt to the ground, left, you know, with literally white ash, and somehow the fire got around all of the trees to get inside just to burn down those structures. But I will link below to all of these videos, Raytheon's high power microwave weapon, a microwave weapon, not even lasers can they use to down drones with the high frequencies available in those microwave weapons, directed energy weapons. This is a documentary on the History Channel and you can listen to just a few minutes. But lasers won't be just ground-based. They may also be fired at us from the sky. Okay. Actually, listen to just a couple of seconds. Um, you can watch it by clicking on the link below. So the... <laughs> I, I, I was really amazed at listening to Dane say that, um, and he's talking about laser weapons. He says of directed energy weapons, Claudia asking him questions. First, very powerful laser beams exist for testing purposes, testing purposes. And he goes on to say, and a trillion plus watt beam has been produced, but it comes from a ground-based facility, a beam two millimeters wide and produced for one billionth of a second. And then he says, you can't put any platform in the air that can produce anything like that. Is that the only beam? Really? Is that the only beam, laser beam, that they have? Of course it isn't. And perhaps because, you know, you say these things, people hear it, very powerful laser beams exist for testing purposes, and you hear somebody who's articulate and people believe it because they haven't done any research. But how somebody like Dane Wigington can say this, it's beyond me. And say that a trillion plus watt beam has been produced that is at a ground-based facility, meaning that there's no airborne beam, no airborne lasers, but he says that it's a beam two millimeters wide, produced for only one billionth of a second. And that's it. That's all he says. Well, people who have not done any research will listen to that and say, oh, okay, well, I guess lasers weren't involved. And unfortunately, Claudia says, right, great, and then moves on. And she apparently has believed his nonsense about these uh, fires that simply left untouched, even the leaves, pine trees, needles. Yeah, they're green. So that's why they didn't, they didn't burn. But the structure, it's the same it's the same kind of illogic of Judy Wood. Um, 
you know, there are so many different directed energy weapons that it's really, when you look into what our military actually has, and then you start thinking about what we don't know, the kind of technology where, yes, Claudia, they could actually decimate entire areas, but um, military directed energy weapon laser companies surround Northern California, the Firestorm area, and this is a plain truth dot info. And he is talking about what Dane's response has been to people about these fires and the use of directed energy weapons. Uh, Mr. Dane Wigginton is, is being regulated to the Dust Bowl of irrelevancy if he keeps making comments like this without providing any type of evidence. Uh, he's saying in regard to the firestorms, there's great many basics, cl baseless claims circulating. He's with geoengineeringwatch.org and had been a former um, uh, leader in the geoengineering movement, chemtrails, but uh, I'm beginning to question that. Uh, extreme destruction were to occur from energy beams spiraling down from the sky. Wouldn't have they been seen by many? Well, Dane, look at my video yesterday. I showed documentation of actual beams coming down from the sky. Watch the videos and learn. Directed any weapons of caliber, caliber existed, if they existed. Well, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, during the night when California ignited, it would be easily visible. Uh, we saw it. We recorded it. Record low fuel, fuel moisture. Uh, we just had a record rains, Dane, record rains and snow this year in California. So why are you saying low fuel moisture? Other species of living green trees would also not burn to try and explain why, why pines didn't burn. I mean, oak trees didn't burn. Leaves still on the trees. These were thousands of degrees temperatures, folks. But they okay, so <clears throat> it's not only myself. It's not only a plain truth dot info. It is so many who are seeing what is obvious and pointing it out. But perhaps... Uh, Dane doesn't know about directed energy weapons, um, the scalar weapons that <laughs> we have, and the Soviets were far more advanced than we were. I want to, and unfortunately I lost my spot, read just a little bit of... Uh, what was going on in 1986, Reagan and Gorbachev, these scale, scalar weapons that the Soviets were already using were so powerful that they were negotiating um, to dismantle the nuclear weapons and to come to some kind of an agreement to for us not to do any kind of development on the scalar weapons but also to agree to not use these weapons against each other or any other country but what do they say here about these scalar weapons and I will link below to this article written by Tom Bearden who was and still is an expert in scalar weapons but he is, um, oh, Jesus, I can't remember his title. He is a retired lieutenant colonel of um, the U.S. Army, research scientist, scalar expert. And you can go on YouTube and put in his name, Scalar Weapons, and listen to some of these talks or interviews and he's talking about weather modification by scalar waves, applied scalar wave technology, and he has a website. He has written this article, The History of Scalar Weapons. But right here, he speaks of the reason for adamant Soviet insistence that the... Uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, Genie, must not be tested in space, is that should the U.S. develop scalar electromagnetic weapons, such as high-energy scalar lasers, 
and deploy them as strategic defense initiative modifications. Now, understand this. Remember Reagan talking about the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which we were going to be using to protect us? That was cover for an awful lot of research into all of these weapons. But Tom Reardon points out that the Russians were already using scalar weapons and um, should the U.S. develop scalar electromagnetic weapons such as high-energy scalar lasers and deploy them, the power would be enormously increased. With one or two shots, such a laser could devastate a whole republic of the USSR. So, again, I have to say that this interview with uh, Dane and Claudia, I don't think that they have done the research well enough to even speak on the subject. Listen to what uh, Ilana Freeland has to say. I received, uh, I was privy to one email in which someone, uh, in fact, I think it was Matt Landman, who is the creator of the very good film uh, Franken Skies. Matt sent me a complex of uh, articles in an email, so I tracked them down. And then um, another friend sent me what uh, his sister had said about the fire because she was there and she was able to give an eyewitness account with her perceptions. And when I put the two of those things together, I, I had a full-blown picture of a directed energy weapon uh, being used. Uh, you can use laser from, the, from high in the sky, up in, uh, above Earth in the uh, near-Earth orbit. Uh, you can use geostationary, you can use uh, those that are orbiting, but a, but a satellite can easily start a fire uh, from space uh, right down to a very small area. And you would, of course, control the area uh, with a laptop and, uh, and algorithms, codes, etc. So, um, what I, what I determined was because of just a few words of the, uh, the woman's eyewitness account, and she talked about the wind. And I then remembered uh, reading um, uh, the book about the towers, uh, you know, where did the towers go uh, by Judy, uh, is it Wood? Judy, Dr. Yes, Judy. Dr. Judy Wood. Yep. Um, I remember in the accounts there of many New Yorkers, uh, many of them talking about the quality of the, of the wind. It was not just the speed of the wind. That seemed incidental. It was a certain quality that uh, was described as supernatural, was described as uh, uh, frightening, terrifying, uh, and, and that, that to me... I need to stop right here and uh, recall what a subscriber left in a comment below who lives in that area. She was on the street and suddenly a wind came up and literally, I think, carried her like four feet and nearly knocked her down. She said it came out of nowhere. Me is the hallmark of scalar uh, weaponry. Is uh, Okay, so I will link below to everything. You can listen to this interview. It's very interesting, but I do want to bring your attention to uh, the history of these scalar weapons and I'm going to do a video on this article that Tom Bearden wrote, a video devoted to it, but here he's talking about 
the Challenger. Remember in 1986, the Challenger blew up? Well, the Soviets had learned how to produce these scalar weapons to melt metal. And, well, the metal was melted on the Challenger. And he goes through all of what took place that day. And he also talks about how these uh, small birds, they have brains that are very sensitive to these high frequencies due to their small diameter wavelength as a scalar electromagnetic receiver. They found that there were no birds, no birds the day the Challenger was to be launched. And then later birds dropped from the sky, all different kinds of birds. But what does he say here? He said there were substantial winds and air turbulence over the launch site. It increased the stress on the Challenger. These scalar waves can produce winds that would not that they just would not be there if they were not using some kind of scalar weaponry. So, um, you know, 60 fires, Dane Wigington does acknowledge that these fires, a lot of them started simultaneously. So he does believe that arson was involved. Okay, but we can't question the use of lasers to create the fires, scalar weaponry to destroy all of those structures. Considering the kind of weaponry that we do know of, it seems kind of strange to me that, well, Someone like Judy Wood, who understands directed energy weapons, would laugh at us, call us stupid and gullible, and she too believing that we jumped on a bandwagon as if, you know, somebody started, you know, the chain, and then, well, all of us, we don't have brains, and we can't think for ourselves. We just jumped on the bandwagon and went with whatever that first person said about the directed energy weapons. I mean, it, it's so insulting. It's so degrading. Um, but we have just unbelievable technology. And Air Force attack drones with fire laser weapons. And, you know, um, Ilana Freeland talks about the algorithms and the codes that they can set to bring about destruction precisely. And you will see that, just to try to get this video done, you will see how incredibly magnificently coordinated these unmanned drones are with men and women just sitting at computers. They controlling all of it. And these drones actually have lasers on them. So how Dane Wigington could possibly say that you can't put any of this on a platform in the air is really It, it, it's incomprehensible. I, I just don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. The technology is real. We yes, the technology is around, real. And we're also moving it out into the field and showing to ourselves and to our customers that this technology is real. You have speed of light delivery. You push a button, the laser's at the target immediately. You don't have a fly out of time. The munition is a precision beam of light that we point at the target and we have a virtually unending supply. With our systems, you never run out of power. You can keep shooting as long as the adversary keeps throwing targets at you. There is a lot of mission space where the covert capability of the laser is also beneficial because you can cause an effect without there being any visible sign of what, what caused that effect. 
No visible sign. Well, it's hard to get. It's hard to get direct evidence. But um, there are so many videos of the technology that exists with this uh, lasers being used as weapons. <laughs> Operationally, it works uh, just like a laser pointer. Um, there's a chamber inside with special materials that release photons. If you're looking at a, a, a boat coming in over the water, you can target exactly the engine and take out exactly the engine and not necessarily damage anything else. So, and that type of precision weapon work is, is something that you don't really get with conventional weapons because there's, there tends to be more collateral damage. So, you can use these weapons and you can target something precisely, destroy it, and nothing else. Nothing else, like trees. Um, airborne laser. Airborne lasers. And I will link below to all of these. U.S. Navy laser test takes down drone. And lasers can be invisible. And there are so many different airborne uh, uses of these, uh, or delivery systems, of these lasers. So I just want you to see one more. Um, here is eight insane future military laser weapons and it's not future they have them german company mbda makers of a variety of offensive and defensive military weapon systems has announced the development of a high intensity laser effector intended mostly as an air defense weapon against hostile forces and terrorist threats the 40 to 120 kilowatt laser will be able to lock onto targets either at close range or at distances of up to 2,000 meters away the prototype which has already been successfully tested against uavs is hoped to be scaled up for large moving air targets or made compact for smaller threats it now, as you watch these videos, notice that when the laser hits its target, it bursts into flames. This laser hit the tail of this drone. You don't hear it, but you just see the tail of the plane burst into flames. And this video on Fox News uh, hopefully it'll come up. I'm really sorry, my computer is dying. I'll pause you until it comes up. Lasers sound like the stuff of science fiction, right? Sound completely unbelievable. How could our military possibly be using this in future warfare? Guess what? We've just had a recent breakthrough, more great test results that are making lasers a reality. So it's called Athena. Lockheed Martin makes it, and they've been doing a lot of the pioneering in this laser field. Now, what's really exciting about it is that it's so hard to harness that much power and make it compact enough that it's actually going to make practical sense down in range. And they've proven that they can do that. Uh, recently, uh, they tested it against five moving drones, so realistic drones that they might go up against, with, uh, you know, enemy forces might send against us, for example, uh, or terrorists might send against us. Uh, and it successfully shot down all five of the drones. This is huge news because it means that in a realistic, practical setting, it's looking very promising. So it could be ready to field quite soon. So when you see the movies, or you look at comic books or television shows, when you see the laser weapons, they tend to be a color, right? Red or green or something like that. Uh, real lasers, one of the key advantages that they provide is that they are invisible. You actually can't see them. You just see this damage suddenly starting to blow something up. Uh, so if you take a look now at what the Athena did to a truck. So we're looking at a truck engine, and the Athena within seconds was able to beam right in there, keep the whole thing up, and burn through the engine of this vehicle. So if you can imagine if you were in that vehicle, all of a sudden, this hole would start appearing in your engine, and the whole thing would just disappear.
of beer. That's what these lasers do. Now, there's some other key advantages that we should mention. Let me give you three of them. One, unlimited ammo. As long as we have power, we have an unlimited magazine. And downrange, of course, having unlimited ammo could be a huge advantage. Second, it's silent. Don't give the enemy any advance warning that it's coming. And then the third one I wanted to touch on is that it travels at the speed of light. So not only are we delivering powerful, decisive effects, lethality, we're also doing it so rapidly they don't know what hit them. So if you can circle back to that example of being in the car again, that would happen so instantaneously within seconds, you truly would have no idea what was happening. It would just suddenly start disintegrating, right? So what can we use these against? So we talked about the vehicle a bit. We talked about how Athena has just proven itself against drones. But in the real world application, our forces could use it against the drones. We could use it against aircraft. Uh, we could use it against vehicles on the ground, like we mentioned. Uh, we could also use it against fast attack boats. And in fact, Athena's sibling, Adam, a couple years ago, proved that it could eliminate these fast attack boats. If you imagine, boats start trying to swarm one of our ships. Not a problem for this laser. Burns right through the hull. As you can see right there, it's burning right through the hull. I'm incredibly excited about this news, this great news about the successful testing of Athena, because it means that we'll be putting these powerful weapons soon, we could put them in the hands of our warfighters and give them even more powerful weaponry uh, to keep themselves safe and also to deliver the effects that we need. They can be used, laser weapons can be used offensively and of course defensively too to help protect our homeland. Think of our airports that might be under threat uh, from enemy drones. They could be used to protect our, we can use them statically and used to protect our airports. They could be used to protect our power grid, our, our nuclear plant. So there's lots of different exciting applications to this technology. There's no longer science fiction, but science facts. All right, so she is obviously very, very excited about these weapons of mass destruction. But the other thing that Dane says is that the beam, they could only hold that beam for one billionth of a second and that the beam was two millimeters wide. Um, they can use these beams and I believe actually target um, target a victim, you know, like a mile, a wide, mile wide, a mile away, I'm sorry. But a lot of freelance says that satellites can um, shoot lasers. So I, I, I don't know how to respond to these claims that are baseless. And they're claiming that we're making baseless claims, discrediting the movement when we're not doing that. And unfortunately, the claims of Dane, and Wig Dane Wigington and Judy Wood are, many of their claims are baseless. And they seem to be discrediting themselves by making these baseless claims. I want you to check this out. Uh, there was somebody on it long before these California fires. June 20, 2017. Directed energy weapons, the Portugal fires and the Gatlinburg fires. And I'm just going to play a few minutes of this, but listen to what he has to say. And he's saying pretty much what we have been saying about the California fires uh, were there redwood trees in Portugal? Were there redwood trees in Gatlinburg? Dane? They, there, it wasn't just redwood trees that remained green and untouched from the California fires. But there's an awful lot of pine trees in Tennessee, in the mountains of Tennessee, Gatlinburg, that also did not, well, as you'll see in this video, this man pointing out the fires in Portugal as well as Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 
it was able to completely destroy these vehicles. Look at them. The all the glass is melted out, the metal's buckled and, and uh, deformed, all the paint's burnt off. So it's <laughs> an intense heat, and yet the heat was supposed to have reached the cars from the vegetation, the trees, and the trees are intact. Those, tell me what, what burns, what needs a hotter temperature to burn, metal and glass or wood? Obviously the wood would have gone first, right? This is exactly the same as Gatling bird. Look at those saplings down there. They didn't burn. And yet, look at the vehicles, the cars are completely almost melted, the metal. And yet these little twigs and stuff, they didn't burn. And yet the fire was supposed to have reached the cars from the trees. Look at this car, it's melted into the road. Even the, um, uh, the tarmac and the, uh, the road is melted, given way. And yet the trees have still got bark on them, look. Now this is a directed energy weapon focused heat, right? but the engine is completely exposed, it's destroyed the car, and yet these little thin spindly branches are all perfectly intact. That's right. Completely been destroyed, completely. This looks like sort of cement or... Uh, but anyway, they're completely destroyed. You'd think they'd be black, but... Uh, who knows, maybe for some freaky reason they got white ash all over them. Yeah, the trees have still got leaves on them and little branches and twigs. The, the, what I'm saying is that the heat originated here and then slightly singed the surrounding area. It did not reach the houses from the surrounding area because the surrounding area would have had to be completely incinerated. And, and then they're untouched, as he says. Highly selective. destroyed the skyline. Sparing the chairs themselves, but destroying the... Look at this tree here. This should have had its um, leaves and little branches burnt off, and yet it's intact, and yet the ground... What's he saying? Wheelhouse. Dollywood remains unscathed, while community and the chairs themselves, but destroying the wheelhouse. The fire almost destroyed the sky lift, sparing the chairs themselves, but destroying the wheelhouse. Destroyed the wheelhouse. Another house completely destroyed, just like in 9-11. It works selectively on whatever material they dial it, dial it uh, to, to affect. It's infrasound, you know, it's a frequency thing. Uh, the trees, they were probably burnt by the, the, the heat radiating off the focus of the uh, directed energy beam, which was the building here, which completely flattened, destroyed. Dollywood remain. Okay, so I will link below to everything. Um, I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, I looked at these Gatlinburg fires. I posted videos on it, and I didn't catch, not until the California fires, these anomalies that now suddenly are very, very clear. Directed energy weapons. There's a whole slew of them. So, while many will say lasers, or some have said scalar weapons, and some have uh, even said microwave weapons. Uh, you heard him say ultrasound, or uh, frequencies can be used for good purposes or really destructive purposes. And to deny that and claim that those who are saying and questioning the use of directed energy weapons that we are being stupid we're just jumping on a bandwagon and uh, and that we are discrediting the anti-geoengineering movement I frankly at this point I, I I'm sorry I it's a disgrace to do this um, both both the geoengineering and directed energy weapons, both geoengineering setting the stage, creating the environment 
as so flammable incendiary, the use of directed energy weapons or lasers could have ignited those fires. The use of scalar weapons could have produced the winds and destroyed those structures. And to simply say that that is just an unfounded question, uh, is really remarkable. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's, it truly is as if some people can only think about one particular aspect of something and then they just want to knock everything out. Anything that is not related or indirectly related 